Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Happy Saturday to everyone, whatever part of the country you are in. Good morning. It's 8.30 here on the West Coast. If you're on the West Coast, uh, like um, me and my guests are today. And I hope that everyone has had a wonderful month. July has just flown by. We are on the last Saturday and the last day of the month. So we're going to give everyone just a couple more minutes to get in here and we're going to get started because we have a lot to discuss today and I don't want to uh, to have to shorten our discussion. So welcome everyone. My name is Nicole Bafong and you are um, in the Health is Wellness webinar for Minorities for Medical Marijuana. So I hope you have found the right place. You could join us on our Facebook Live at M4, the number four, MM United. Or you can join us on our YouTube page at the same M4, MM United. So welcome, welcome, welcome. And my name is Nicole Buffong. I am the Western Regional Director for Minorities for Medical Marijuana. I am a cannabis patient and advocate. And uh, the, the science of around the plant, um, using the plant for my wellness uh, just fascinates me. So I'm so grateful that I get to share uh, these health is wellness webinars with you all um, as we discuss some really important topics on the different diseases that affect um, people in our communities and how they can treat those diagnoses and those symptoms with cannabis and other plant medicine. Um, but today we are going to be discussing autoimmune disorders. And real quick, I just wanted to give a definition before I introduce my guest so everyone kind of understands. I had to do my own research because um, I'm not quite familiar with all of the autoimmune disorders. Um, and so, uh, real quick, autoimmune disease is the result of a malfunctioning immune system where healthy cells are mistaken for foreign bodies causing the immune system to attack healthy cells in the body. It is estimated that as many as 50 million Americans suffer from some form of autoimmune disease. There are more than 80 potential autoimmune disorders. There are many different forms and the symptoms and effects will vary from case to case. Treatment for autoimmune diseases typically focuses on managing pain and symptoms of the condition. And that's what we're really going to talk about today. I'm so excited um, to introduce um, the co-founder of Cannabis Nurses of Color, Miss Sandra Gwines. Did I say that right? Yes. Yay. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Who is also known as the Kush Nurse. Oh, good we're so morning. grateful to have you. Good morning, Sandra, Nurse Sandra. Good <laughs> How morning. are you today? I am so excited. I can't believe I'm saying I'm so excited to be up early on a Saturday, but I am <laughs> super excited when I get an opportunity to discuss cannabis and um, all of the health benefits that this plant can give us. So thank you for that introduction and for having me. And of course, representing my cannabis nurses of color um, gives me such an honor because I know that these conversations are so important in our community, especially the black and brown community where, where, where we're seeing a lot of these autoimmune conditions um, are prevalent. So thank you so much for having me and this discussion because I think it's so important. Oh, thank you. And I really appreciate you taking your time on your Saturday morning to join us. So yes. let's jump right in because I know we have a lot to cover, right? Um, so real quick though, please tell us about a little bit about yourself and a little bit about how you co-founded um, with Nurse Ivory, the Cannabis Nurses of Color. Tell us about that. Yes. So I became a cannabis patient first. That's how I arrived at cannabis. I was a maternity nurse um, and I have a background in case management and managing high-risk patients. And 
Um, when I was in the hospital setting, I never even thought of cannabis as medicine. Um, it wasn't something that I saw in records. It wasn't something that I saw with my patients. Um, I lived on the East Coast um, primarily. We moved to California about six years ago. And I started seeing, you know, wow, dispensaries. And, and I still didn't feel like, oh, cannabis is something I would try. Um, I ended up having a lot of postpartum depression with my daughter, um, which led me down the path of trying cannabis as medicine. Um, after I had tried everything else, I tried all the pharmaceutical drugs and I didn't like the effects. Um, my quality of life using those medications wasn't the best. Um, and I chose to go down the route of trying cannabis medicine. Um, there wasn't a lot of information out there, especially in the medical realm. Like I just felt like no nurses I talked to, no doctors I talked to really could help me or guide me in this cannabis journey. So I started to do more research and I realized, wow, there is like a whole world out here of people who are already diving into this and are doing the legwork to learn more about cannabis therapy. And, um, and that kind of, you know, I jumped off a cliff. I was like, today I'm going to learn everything possible about cannabis um, and how this plant can really help us. Um, it wasn't an easy path because you don't have anyone to guide you. You also have a lot of the stigmas um, related to it. As a nurse, I couldn't tell my job I was using cannabis. Mm -hmm. But I saw the therapeutic benefits. Um, I saw the changes in my life and my pain and my quality of um, life every day, um, how I could be a better uh, mother, a better wife, a better individual, um, be more focused. There were so many benefits for me um, that I felt like I needed to bring this information to more people. And the people that were most difficult to reach were the black and brown community. Um, when I started talking to my family or other people that I knew, it was kind of like, girl, wait a minute, you talking about cannabis? <laughs> like <laughs> the weed? <laughs> like, wait a minute, are you using this? Like, I remember talking to a nurse um, in North Carolina and she was like, I'm sorry, she's in Virginia. And she was like, wait a minute, wait a minute we using this? Like, what are we doing with this? And I'm like, <laughs> yes. Um, and and it, it was a, it was a struggle, right? Because that's my credibility as a, as a professional, as a career that I've had, you know, for 17 years. And it's trying to teach someone that this is actual medicine, that we haven't learned this information, but that, you know, the research is ongoing, but there's so much information that already validates this. So from there, um, I met Ivory, we were planning on going to a cannabis nurses conference. Um, and when we walked into this conference, we realized that there were so many other nurses out there that looked like her and I, um, you know, from black and brown community, but we were terrified to have these conversations within our own communities. Mm -hmm. We were terrified to talk about it. We were terrified to tell people that cannabis is medicine because of the stigma, because of the system, because of all the things that, you know, have kept us from even considering cannabis as, as medicine. And then some people who actually were affected by the harms of the, the war on drugs and are you know experiencing that through family members or themselves. Mm -hmm. So cannabis nurses of color was really a safe space for us to have those conversations and also to equip nurses with how to go into the community and talk to the people that look like you that need this information because it's gonna be tough and our counterparts may not understand how to navigate those waters, but we're here to have those tough conversations because we're here to serve our people. That's awesome. That's amazing. When, when did you all launch um, Cannabis so, Nurses of Color? So we actually, it was very, I always tell people, it was very organic. We went to this conference, we sat at a table and I say that was the night the table was built. We went to dinner with, I believe like 25 other nurses and we all sat at this table and we did not want to leave each other. We were like, we can't believe that we even exist. I mean, it was nurses from all over the United States. Um, right. And everyone pretty much had the same concerns. You know, it's kind of like, how do we navigate this space? How do we keep our nursing careers and our licenses? And how do we maintain our integrity, our credibility and and reach the people that we want to reach with such limited resources and whether it's legal or illegal in our states? So it was just so much to navigate. And at that point, we were like, OK, we're just going to we're just going to consolidate this effort and create a group. And that's really what it started off as an organic group. And from there, we've started doing, that was two years ago. And we've started doing um, our speaker series where we bring different speakers from the cannabis industry to help educate and guide these nurses. Um, and also cannabis nursing is an entrepreneurial venture mostly. There are not many traditional roles. So it's also helping equip nurses with the tools they need to go out in the community. And what, what are the this. What are the seats on the bus that nurses can take in this cannabis industry? You know, because it's mm -hmm. it's so wide open right now. Mm -hmm. It's so wide mm -hmm. open. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and nurses are always the the angels, right? They're oh. there. They're constantly. They're the ones that they're, they're, they're the true caretakers. You know, yes. when you're in the hospital, the doctor comes, and and you might see the doctor once or twice for your hospital stay. It depends on how long you're there, but. If you are, if you're a nurse, you're constantly, you're in there checking on your patient every hour. I know when um, I have to get a blood transfusion because I have anemia and fibroids Mm. and that's a whole nother conversation. So about every six months or so, every three months has been here lately, I have to get a blood transfusion Mm. and and nurses are in there every hour checking on me and checking on my, my, you know, um, my stats and and making sure that I'm okay. I see the doctor maybe once when I get there and then when it's time to leave. Um, so the nurses are so hands-on and they're so very important in your health care. Yeah. And I'm so grateful that you two um, powerhouses decided to start this organization um, because it's needed. The conversation is needed. You know, I find that I have more conversations with nurses about my health care when I'm in the hospital. And, you know, educating them about how I use cannabis. Um, And it would be a relief to be able to have a conversation with a nurse that understood um, the the way that I was choosing to to treat myself, the way that I was choosing to treat my particular diagnosis. Because I use RSO to manage my pain Mm. for my fibroids and my menstrual. Um, You know, I don't I, I don't use Tylenol. I don't use pain medicines at all. Um, and so obviously it's a different type of lifestyle, you know, that when you're yes. in the hospital, they want to give you, you know, just when I get a blood transfusion, they want to give me Tylenol. And I'm like, no, nope, yes. it's okay. I'm good. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. And that's um, hard but, to navigate as a patient. You know, yeah. I tell people it's, it's one of the things that I love about cannabis nursing is giving my patients the confidence and the tools so that they can go and speak to their providers about cannabis medicine, because most of the providers haven't learned this information. It's not something that was taught in medical school. It's not something that was taught in nursing school. So you find that there's a little bit of resistance um, depending on how long it's been legal in your state, there could be even more resistance, right? Because then it's, it's, it's less um, supported. And the, um, you know, the, the uh, Association for let's see, American Academy of Physicians, they're not supportive of cannabis. Their stance is no on cannabis as medicine. So it really makes it difficult for providers to feel like they can jump off this cliff that is cannabis medicine um, <laughs> and, and dive into this world. You know, for nurses, um, it is complicated as well. But we have um, the National Council for State Boards of Nursing, our regulatory body that gives us our licensing and all those things has said, hey, we're going to put together this 60 page document that shows what a role, the role of the nurse is when managing medical marijuana patients. And because of this document, it's given us guidance on every level of nursing from LPN to advanced practice nurse and also what student nurses should be learning in the classroom. And so we also have a uh, wow. recently released textbook for nursing. Um, it's the handbook. Nurses Handbook. I'm alive because I don't know the name of the book, <laughs> but it's on my <laughs> desk somewhere here. But we'll, we we'll, we'll make sure out. we'll make sure to get that information yes. out yes. to our, our listeners, because yes. that sounds like a, a valuable piece of literature yes. for sure. And it's, it's, for sure. it's important for us because it's valid. It's validating the work that we're doing. It's validating the role of the nurse and it's validating cannabis as medicine. So, you know, just know that even if your doctor or your nurse or if your health care providers are not supportive of of cannabis, that there's so much research and information out there. So definitely get with a nurse or another one of these wonderful educators that are out here, you know, connect with the resources so that you feel confident when you're going in and talking about what your decision is as far as cannabis medicine. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So let's dive yes. in because we've got a lot of, 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 of juicy stuff. Too. Yes. Yes. Discuss. Um, so let's go, let's start off first um, with rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid okay. arthritis. Yes. So rheumatoid yes. arthritis has the most research, which is fascinating to me because. Um, That's what I found as well. Yeah. yeah, it has the most research. So it's great to start with that one um, and then kind of trickle down from there. So, you know, a lot of people may not know, you know, arthritis in general is usually related to pain, pain in the joints or synovial area, which is like the fluid inside your joints. So Mm -hmm. a lot of times people will have, you know, with rheumatoid arthritis, you'll see that they'll have like limited mobility, pain in their fingers, overall body pains and things. 
Um, and cannabis has been shown to actually be a great tool for rheumatoid arthritis. And I did pull up the studies on this because I love the studies and I love the data and it's always important to have that. So with rheumatoid arthritis, CBD was found to be like the the cannabinoid um, in the plant that was most effective. Um, and they had 26 primary studies. So 26 studies were conducted on does it work with rheumatoid arthritis? And they found that there was an 88% positivity rate. That means that 88% of those studies showed that CBD was effective in helping with managing the rheumatoid arthritis symptoms. So that's awesome. So some people may say, well, what does it do? So because um, CBD is an anti-inflammatory and it's also what we call immunomodulating. So what that means is it can modulate or change or adapt your immune system. And really what cannabis does is to help us bring that immune system back to balance. So whether you're having not enough fluid in there or whether you're needing to um, have pain relief in those areas, you can achieve that with the cannabis therapies that are have already been tried. And so, you know, it's kind of interesting too, because we don't have a lot of clinical research. So that's where we get, um, so that's where we get the, the issues sometimes, right? Because a lot of these studies have been done on, you know, rats <laughs> and right. we have Not very human. limited, right. um, right very limited studies on humans. And it's not because it's not effective or it's not safe. It's only because of the legalities of it. So I always want to remind people that many of the studies that we have lots of studies, but many of the studies aren't on humans because of, um, you know, the federal legalities related to cannabis. Right, right. And and that's one of, one of the um, things I wanted to make sure that I mentioned here, um, that we are not giving medical advice. We right. are just having a conversation yes. about the diagnosis, the disease itself, and letting people know, like you said, based on research, yes. um, what, what has been proven says. to help. And and because um, uh, arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic inflammation, so, right? That it, that's important. Yes. It's inflammation <laughs> of the lining of the joints, and yeah. so we know how anti-inflammatory CBD is. Um, so let me ask you a quick question in regards to rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it, it affects the joints and the muscles, right? And so would a topical be more favorable or would a tincture, something that you take internally, be more favorable for something like this? So we find that, I mean, in, in my practice, so I do have an actual cannabis consulting practice and I work with mm -hmm. patients regularly. So we find mm -hmm. that topicals are very helpful. Um, but they may not give long lasting relief. So most right. topicals patients may need to reapply every two hours or so. Right. So right. it can be helpful for some patients. But what I find is people who use topicals tend to carry their topicals like hot sauce in their bag. <laughs> <laughs> and pulling it out every time they get a little twinge. And they twinge, put it on right? everything, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yes. So, you know, you know, topicals are like the new hot sauce you just right. that on everything. Right. And yeah, you carry yeah. it with you all the time, which is very beneficial. I am, you know, definitely one of those people. I have topicals all around my house um, because <laughs> I have neck pain. I tend to apply it often, but it does only give you, you know, a few hours of relief. So in turn, when you take something internally, then you are the benefits of that is that it's metabolized to the liver and then you're getting longer lasting relief. However, yeah every person is different. So right. somebody may find benefits from the topical versus the, um, the oral tincture, tincture yeah. or oils. Um, but we do find that for many patients who have these autoimmune conditions, longer lasting relief is so important because it allows them to have a better quality of life. Okay. Right. Because what we want to do is manage these symptoms so that people can go to work or, you know, spend time with their kids or, you know, do things. Right. Um, and it's really hard to do things if you only have two hours of relief at a time. So right. um, the goal, what's, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. No, no, no. I, go ahead. The goal. Go ahead. Yeah, I feel like the goal is really quality of life. When I look right. at patients, every patient is different. Some patients don't want to ingest. So we really focus on what the patient's desires are in cannabis right. medicine. And I think that's the, I mean, to me, that's like the magic, you know what I mean? It's like, Absolutely. how can this, how can we marry this medicine that could potentially work with your lifestyle? Because if you can't apply every two hours, like if I was working in the hospital, I don't have, I can't apply every two hours. Right. 
I needed something longer lasting to make it through the day. Right. So having an, you know, a oral, a gummy or, you know, an oil or something like that, that's going to last a little bit longer would be more beneficial. Right. Because normally for this type of diagnosis, they prescribe steroids. Right. Correct. Um, and and what and other opioids. things do, and opioids. <laughs> And so we know that, you know, opioids don't have as much of a benefit for inflammation necessarily. Um, and, and steroids um, have a list, a huge long list of side effects, side um, effects. as well as opioids. And, and of course, the risk of being addicted to opioids, overdosing on opioids, all of those factor in. Um, and so um, it's these options using CBD as an alternative to steroids and opioids is what we're talking about, because technically um, they say there's no cure for autoimmune disorders. Right. right. There, that is something that is you live with for the rest of your life once you're diagnosed and, right. and all you're trying to do is manage the symptoms. You're just trying to make sure, like you said, you have a decent quality of life that you can play with your kids, that you can go sh grocery shopping, um, you know, whatever it is that you do on a daily and that this diagnosis doesn't prevent you from living your best life. Um, right. and, and using CBD or cannabis products or um, cannabis byproducts can help with the symptoms, right? Correct. Correct. And, you know, I, I want to always mention that, you know, I don't feel that it's always like a all or none. So, you know, we found a lot of benefits in people who use opioids in combination with cannabis for different conditions. Um, and they can use less opioids than they would have to, or, you know, still have a, it potentiates is the word that we use. So sometimes cannabis can help improve the quality of the opioid medicine and how it's working in your system. And so you can mm. take less and still see results. So okay. it's not always an all or none. And I think we have to look at every situation differently. And so one right. of the things that I like to tell my patients is we're never going to say no, we're going to say, let's look at it, right. <laughs> you know, because- let's um, every patient is a little bit different and depending on their quality of their pain, um, yeah. or their conditions and how it's affecting them, they may need something else. But what yeah. I always, cause someone asked me recently, they said, well, if cannabis doesn't help completely, you know, get me off pharmaceuticals, what's the point? And I always tell people quality of life is so important. And we need to remember, like, isn't it great to get sleep? Isn't it great to not have pain? Isn't it great right. to find joy in things? Isn't it great right. to be able to live? Um, right. And so some of those things are really suppressed when we have these autoimmune conditions. And because we've been conditioned by these conditions to <laughs> not look for joy or be able to move or be able to do things because the condition is limiting, we have to remember that with cannabis, sometimes we can improve our quality of life and minimize those conditions enough to be able to, you know, like you said, live, do things. <laughs> right, right. And and like you said, we don't realize how limited we are by these, by the symptoms from the disease um, until we find actual relief. And then we're like, oh, I didn't, I forgot I could do this again. Um, and it might be something as simple as, like you said, sleep you know, not realizing that the pain is keeping you up and you're losing hours of sleep because yeah. of it. Um, okay, so let's jump in to um, lupus. Lupus. Who had you know, lupus. lupus. Lupus is a challenging one. Um, so there were only, I believe, four clinical, four trials, and I think they were all subclinical, uh, preclinical trials. I should go back and look at this. But the pre, yeah, it's preclinical. So basically, what we found similar to rheumatoid arthritis is that it can downregulate or kind of bring those triggering um, symptoms that we're feeling kind of bring that back down to balance so that we're not having those outbreaks and those conditions. So um, with lupus, there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of inflammation. Those are like the main characteristics. Um, you can also have skin conditions, um, metabolism issues. Like there's so many things that come with lupus. Lupus is so... Um, it's a challenging condition because even the doctors sometimes it takes them a long time to diagnose people with lupus um, because it's such a complicated condition. Um, mm -hmm. But again, CBD seems to be the winner here in the research. Um, and it's shown again, CBD is an immunomodulator. So that means it can 
you know, upregulate or downregulate your immune system. It can bring you back to balance. It can minimize. I always remind people, I'm like, in our body, it's like there's, you know, if you want to take it to something more, um, let's get woo here. You have all these little everything's kind of like, you know, it's like fried wires, right? Yes. And so with cannabis, we can kind of bring that frazzle down a little bit and just get back to basic, okay? Whether it's, you know, immune, whether it's, you know, inflammation, whether it's pain, it's just bringing it down a little bit so that we can kind of see that, um, you know, we can have those therapeutic effects. So with CBD, it was found to be um, the cannabinoid, again, this is based on the studies that exist. We right. haven't done that many studies. So if we start doing more studies with THC, they might see some benefits in there. Right. Um, but from the studies that we have seen, CBD, um, topicals, inhalables, and um, tinctures and oils have seen to be um, a positive uh, therapeutic effect for lupus. And okay. so... <clears throat> And a lot of the people, they have different different conditions, different symptoms, but really what it's shown is that it is calming to those um, reactive symptoms that lupus patients seem to have because lupus tends to be a like an outbreak or a cyclical type of event where, you know, you might be okay for a few weeks or months and then, you know, you get mm -hmm. this symptom that kicks in and starts to affect you. A flare up, they call flare it, right? Up, correct. Yes. And so um, I just want to kind of talk about, we, we talked about two diseases that are uh, commonly diagnosed or the symptoms are common with inflammation, right? Yes. Um, and me as a cannabis patient, I have um, HIV. I was diagnosed with HIV, which affects the immune system. Um, and so reducing the amount of mucus in my body um, helps to keep my immune system in balance. And so as much as I love combusting my flour, I understand that when I do that, the toxins are released in, in the smoke and I'm inhaling that and which increases the mucus in my body. So there is not the only option for people is not to smoke cannabis, right? There are Correct. so many other options, um, especially when we're talking about CBD. But what are some of the things that you want to tell people about their use of CBD? when it comes to finding the right product for them, because there's, you know, you could get CBD gummies in your gas station right now, you know, in states that are not even legal. <laughs> so, you know, what, <laughs> what, what do you, what advice do you want to give to people that are looking for the right CBD products? Since that's what has been the most common thread with these two diseases so far, right. so, what, do you, what advice would you like to give people? So the biggest thing is like, where is the CBD coming from? You know, I tend to, you know, like we have a grocery store here, we have a Sprouts, you can go to Sprouts and you can get CBD. And not to say that all the CBD at Sprouts isn't great, but you just have to kind of look through them. Definitely looking for labs. Um, you know, each of these, if they're a well-known CBD company, if they have a great product, they should be giving you the labs. You want to know, you know, what's in this, you know, and where, you know, what's the, what, what is in, what, what part of the flower did they use? So a lot of times you'll hear um, CBD isolate, CBD, um, full spectrum, CBD broad spectrum. And those are things that are important for you to know. Um, we find that with whole plant, that means the plant, the way it's grown, the hemp plant, they pull it out and then they, you know, harvest it, dry it, mm -hmm. and then you consume that in various mm -hmm. forms, um, mm -hmm. but not removing the CBD and the THC from the plant. If you have the whole plant and the CBD and THC are working together in that plant, there's a synergistic effect and that right. seemed to show the best results um, when you consume the plant as is. Now, there's some people who cannot consume the plant with the THC um, because of work or, you know, what have you, or maybe they have a THC sensitivity. There's many reasons. Um, but then you'd have to look at like a CBD isolate, which is where they just remove the CBD from the plant. And then that's all you're consuming. There's no other cannabinoids in there. Um, but there's so many other cannabinoids in the CBD plant or in the hemp plant that people don't consider um, that can be beneficial. We're still kind of cutting. It's like we're at, the, ooh, we're at the surface here still. You know, everything that we're learning about the cannabis plant, um, we know that it works. People see results, but knowing exactly how and which cannabinoids work for each thing, this is a science that we are just at the surface level right now. But the most important thing is knowing that you have a clean source 
that your plant, it preferably I would say is whole plant if you can have it, um, and that you have lab results for these plants so that you know, you know where this batch came from, what the quality of it is. Um, <clears throat> And then also, you know, I don't get into like how it was extracted and all these things, but there's a lot of times that you'll, you won't get the whole plant. You'll get like aerial parts of the plant and things like right. that. So it's important to know the quality of the cannabis um, that you're consuming. And a lot of times I'll get people that will say CBD didn't help. And I'll say, well, let me see what you tried. Yep. Yep. That's what I was getting at. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was getting at. I, a lot of people tell me that as well. And I'm like, well, what did you use? And yeah. I don't know, something I ordered on Amazon. Okay, well, right. um, so let's 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 look at what that is. Let's did, did it come with a COA um, yes. in, in our in yeah. our industry that's called a certificate of analysis? That's exactly. the task testing and labs that you were referring to. Um, is it full spectrum? Is it an isolate? You know, what else is it mixed with? Are you vaping it? Are you, is it a tincture? Is it gummy? Right. So are you mixing it with sugar and a bunch of other ingredients? Yes. So all of those matter. All it of those all questions. It all matters. It all yeah. matters. You know, I, I get to become a CBD snob sometimes because I Me feel too. like once you know, then it's really hard to just try any and all things. That's um, right. But because I'm a nurse and what I love about this particular plant is that it's so safe. You know, I would tell my clients, I try to try everything. Like if somebody says, I tried this, I'm like, well, let me see. And let me look at it, research it as best I right. can. If I feel like it has benefits, I'll try it myself. Right. Even though it's a case by case basis, how it will work. But right. I like to know, like, generally, what what's the results of using this? Right. Um, and because cannabis is such a safe plant, we know that there have been no deaths reported from overdosing of cannabis. Um, right. We also know that CBD um, is the kind of medication where you start low but go high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, you don't you don't use. A lot of times, people are afraid to consume more CBD because it's just that stigma that we're getting high that we're using cannabis. So when I tell them you might be on, you know, hundreds of milligrams a day or you know, 25 milligrams a day, they're like, what? You know, and I always try to remind them that, you know, each person is different. Their sensitivity That's right. is different. Um, That's results right. are different. But what we know is that there is therapeutic value and there's also a safe, you know, this is a safe plant and that we can use these higher levels of CBD to achieve the results. And, and I'm glad you said that, that this is a safe plant. Um, you know, I, some of us are familiar with the controversy of what's happening in the Olympics right now. And I'll just touch on this briefly mm -hmm. uh, because this is a whole conversation. Yes. Uh, Kari was suspended because she tested positive for THC. Um, and um, the soccer um, Olympiad that came out with her CBD line just um, last week. Mm -hmm. So it, it it's it's controversial that they're saying that one part of the plant is okay, but another part of the plant is not. Um, and 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 these two white women are allowed to promote the safe part of the plant um, and talk about how they use it to help with recovery. Um, but using THC, which we know is not a performance enhancement drug, um, is somehow still on the banned list. Um, and, and so that's a whole nother conversation and, and maybe mm -hmm. Shikari will be uh, the catalyst for changing that. Um, and unfortunately she had to lose her spot in order to have that, for us to have that conversation. But, you know, Rosa Parks had to go to prison um, in order for us to change that law um, because we, we realized that it was wrong. So, so mm. when we talk about the, the, the safety of this plant, um, we know that throughout history, it's been used for thousands of years for, it's been around longer than um, all of these Western medicines and pharmaceutical drugs um, and being used in ancient herbal medicine every part of the plant. Um, what, what, real quick, what's the difference between a broad spectrum and a full spectrum, just so people can understand? Yes, so the isolate we said is just, they remove the CBD from the plant and then you're just getting CBD, no other cannabinoids. The broad right. spectrum is doesn't have C, a THC in it, but it has other CBD based cannabinoids. So CBG, we have CBN, CBDA, CBD. yeah, we have so many other cannabinoids. So like I was mentioning before, these cannabinoids, um, if you are, because we know we have medical professionals on here, um, I really recommend getting Canakees. I'm not like a sponsor or anything or whatever affiliate, but Canakees is an awesome tool um, to show because you can actually search there 
by cannabinoids, the studies that have been done and mm. what those cannabinoids can help treat. Um, you can also search in there by condition, by organ system, um, all different things. So it's a great tool because it takes all the studies that already exist out in the world and it kind of consolidates them for different so conditions. Spell that, spell so, the name of this site. Sure. Is it a website? Canakeys. Hold on. I think it's canakeys.com, but let me, canakeys.com. Okay. So um, C-A-N-N-A-K-E-Y-S. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so this is a great, great tool. Um, if you go on our Cannabis Nurse of Color uh, page, we actually had can of keys on there and they gave us like a full blown, like behind the scenes, how to use it and things you can do. Oh, um, perfect. So definitely check it out. We don't okay. get nurses support. of color. Yes. Got so, it. But it's a great, great tool. And because we want to empower people to have these conversations, it's really important for us to share the tools that we know. This is this is where the kind of like, what is it? The rubber meets the road. Like right now it's like, we have to work collaboratively so that we can bring this community, this medicine, you know, up, elevate it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Literally. That's right. <laughs> we got to get elevated. That's right. That's right. So, you know, don't be afraid of the research. Don't be afraid of the science. Don't be afraid of the studies. Um, if you have trouble reading those things, you know, talk to other medical professionals. We're happy to kind of like, you know, pare that down and give you, you know, just the chunk and the nuggets of the information that you need, because that's what we're here for. And that's yeah. what helps you have these conversations and feel more confident. Cause that's at the end of the day, we want confident, conscious consumers, um, that understand, you know, what they're putting into their system and are more in control of their life, you know, because of it. And, and, um, real quick, um, even though the United States government has, um, still has THC mm -hmm. as a schedule one drug, with heroin and cocaine. Um, in 2018, when they legalized industrial hemp in this country, they said um, that the cannabis plant with less than 0.3% THC in it is now considered industrial hemp. That's the US, United States definition of what industrial hemp is. So they descheduled CBD. And that's why you all are seeing CBD in everywhere, in your gas station, in your salon, in your coffee shop, is because they descheduled it from a Schedule 1, which is where it has been the last 90 years, to a Schedule 2. Mm -hmm. And so the United States government says that even 0.3% of THC is, that's allowable. That's okay. Um, but... Shikari, you have any amount of THC in your system and you are disqualified. Um, so there's a little bit of a, a, a obviously, um, there, a contradiction there. Um, mm -hmm. And then also with CBD, um, the United States government has a patent on CBD, in case you all did not know that. Um, in 1999, they, they said that CBD was a viable use for neuroprotectant. Um, they have a whole definition, but they patent <laughs> the United States decided that they created CBD somewhere and they were able to <laughs> patent it. Um, and so, for example, the first um, um, FDA approved medication that's on the marketplace, Epidiolex, um, that is used for a rare epileptic disorder, um, is, is using that patent from the United States government to create this medicine. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, I digress. Um, so, so the next disease that I want to talk about is multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis. Yes. So multiple sclerosis. Um, <clears throat> so many studies on multiple sclerosis as well. There were nearly 100 studies on multiple sclerosis. Interestingly enough, with multiple sclerosis, what they found was that equal ratio of THC and CBD are helpful in managing those symptoms. Um, so here we start seeing more of THC used um, to manage some of these um, autoimmune conditions. And, you know, when you think about specifically multiple sclerosis, um, you think of mobility issues, mm -hmm. you think of tremors, you think there's mm -hmm. a lot of neurological involvement. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where I see in my mind where THC is such a benefit there. Um, so what I was saying before, so um, in addition to that, they found terpenes, specific terpenes are helpful for multiple sclerosis, like beta carophylline. And so beta carophylline is shown to help with pain, it's shown to be relaxing, um, and it's really shown to be a neuroprotectant as well. So these are some of the things that we're seeing with multiple sclerosis. And what I am loving about this is, you know, if you know anyone that suffers with multiple sclerosis or seen anyone suffer with multiple sclerosis, it's a very debilitating condition. Um, right. And, um, you know, they're, the biggest thing is their quality of life 
because they cannot do things for themselves sometimes when they go into these spasmic um, episodes or, you know, sometimes they have difficulty walking. They may need a walker, different things. It's a lot of neurological. Um, off balance. Yes, off yeah. balance, all mm -hmm. that. So in addition to that, you know, there is, I always say, you know, we have to look at everything. I always love saying all the positives of cannabis. Um, but when we're looking at any of these patients and specifically multiple, multiple sclerosis, you know, we want to make sure that patients are using the the amount they need to re to achieve the desired effect, but also that it doesn't cause them other issues. Cause we know cannabis can make you dizzy and you know, it can make you tired. It can, you know, have issues with memory, you know, um, your short-term memory loss, things like that. So we want to make sure that we're not, that we're also providing that education and guidance for patients that are using cannabis. Um, because while there were a hundred studies that were shown, the positivity rate for multiple sclerosis is 91%. And the studies were kind of interesting because it shows that even though patients experience, um, you know, maybe they experience dizziness or maybe they experience short-term memory loss or all these other things that we know are possible with cannabis therapies, the benefits outweigh the risk, risks. And they were willing to forego, um, you know, the pharmaceutical medicines and try cannabis because of the quality of lifestyle that they were able to achieve with using cannabis therapies. So I think that to me says so much. Um, yeah, I, I, in some of my research, I saw, you know, that physical therapy, um, and obviously medications help with this particular um, a di this particular disease. Um, and, you know, one of the other things that we haven't mentioned yet um, that I utilize a lot is, of course, diet, right? Mm -hmm. Like with lupus. Um, and even if you're, if you're consuming products um, that cause inflammation, if you're eating things that cause inflammation, then you are increasing the, the symptoms in this disease, in this particular disease. And um, just a side note, you know, folks, you know, sugar causes inflammation. Uh, so, um, you know, it is, it is the legal, it is the FDA approved cocaine um, mm -hmm. because it causes so many other damaging effects to our body. Um, but, you know, those current corn syrup, sugar and all of its different ways is completely legal. Um, and so you have to be mindful when you are, ha when you have an autoimmune disorder mm -hmm. or been diagnosed, what you're consuming has a lot to do with therapies and how, you know, your react to anything, yeah. to medication. So be mindful of that um, when you are consuming edibles. Um, yeah. I know we talked about that as an option, but most edibles are full, filled with sugar. They're gummies or, you know, candy or brownie or cookie. And these are the yeah. kind of things when you're medicating, when you're taking, consuming cannabis as a patient and you're using it to help you know, relieve symptoms, this is sugar is not one of the things that you want to have on your list. So just be mindful of that. I like to remind patients and, and, you know, people that come to me for advice and asking, you know, what they should do and how they should do it. Um, just be mindful unless you're making your own edible and you, and you know how much you, the exact ingredients that you're putting into it with your can of oil or can of butter, mm -hmm. um, just be mindful of that. Right. I, I, and, I love and that. Also, That's great. That's yeah, great. And also advice. a dairy. Um, you know, dairy causes a lot of mucus and inflammation in the body, um, e even though it's, you know, part of a balanced diet, according to the FDA, um, it's not necessarily good for people who are who have an autoimmune disorder. Um, yeah, yes. so I just wanted to add that. <clears throat> I love that advice. I also think it's important for us to remember that all of the so the plant we've talked about the cannabinoids on the plant, but we also briefly touched on the terpenes on the plant. There's a right. lot of aromatic oils that are on the plant that when consumed or inhaled can really provide additional mm -hmm. benefits. <clears throat> and that's why specific strains um, and the way the plants are grown can be more beneficial for one condition over another. So some of the things I like to do also is look at the terpenes that are beneficial for specific conditions, because if we can find those naturally occurring terpenes in other foods and other things, whether it be essential oils or mangoes for myrcene or for carophylline, like we said before, you can find that in cinnamon, peppers and cloves. If you can add those things into your diet, you're only going to, you know, therapeutically benefit, you know, it's only going to add 
um, benefits to your cannabis consumption and your and your and your therapy and the positive effects that you have. Um, so a lot of times people don't even know that these terpenes exist or, you know, I mean, we think about like lavender. Lavender is very relaxing. Well, you know, one of the properties of lavender is linalool. And we find that in many of the relaxing or calming or immunomodulating um cannabis strains um, right. and preparation. So it's important to kind of look at, like you said before, it's not just consuming the plant. Um, it's also changing your lifestyle to adapt and, and help contribute to the positive effects of that plant as well. That's right. Um, and if you're not fortunate like myself to live in a state that mandates terpene testing, um, Nevada mandates terpene testing. Um, and, and I wish California did because I, need it. I, I will admit <laughs> California has some of the best cannabis that I have consumed, um, especially in Northern California. They've got some really good stuff growing outdoors there. Um, and I wish that they did terpene testing because the, the, all of the good flour that is there, it would have so much more benefit if the if the consumer knew what terpene profile they were using, um, and especially for a patient. So uh, if you're living in a state that mandates terpene testing like a Nevada, but if you're living in a state that doesn't, um, uh, there are some uh, websites like leafly.com mm -hmm. that you can go to. You just type in the strain and they can give you an idea of maybe what some of those terpenes are. But yeah. we also know that unless you get it tested, you really don't know. Like the, the, the not the strain, the cultivar is, is based on, you know, who grows it. Many things, and yeah. Yeah, if, if, it's, if it's combined with something else, you've got all these hybrids out there. You just really don't know unless you have it written down on a paper and it shows you what the percentage. And if, if it's, you know, if it's got 16% uh, mercine and, you know, 10%, a line of linalool and and then and and then you know five percent carophylline and then you mix those up and, and you change around the ratios then it has a different effect <laughs> so yeah. so yes i'm so glad you mentioned terpenes because they're so important in how we kind of it, in the physiological effects of what cannabis does um yeah. So do you um, have any other uh, recommendations when it comes to terpenes that are maybe in particular with anti-inflammatory maybe um, so, that you know of? So I definitely feel there's a lot of um, information about beta carotheline because it's okay. relaxing um, and it's also a pain reliever. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people will use, I, I always tell people, if you want to think of beta carotheline, think of cloves. And if you're old school like me, my mama used to say, take a clove and put it when, in your tooth when your tooth hurts. Mm. <laughs> or chew on cloves if you mm. have a toothache. Um, so that's something that is very, just reminds me so much of, you know, the natural pain medicine that already existed, that is part of our culture, that is part of our life, that is part of our heritage. That's right. um, and our parents and our family and our ancestors have been using all this time, you know? So right. when we see it in a plant, it's not, it shouldn't be like, Oh, wow. It should be like, of course, you of, know, course. I mean, of course. <laughs> um, but um, definitely I see cloves. Um, when we think about when people have anxiety or when they are feeling like the effects of THC are too high, um, you can combat that by chewing on peppercorns or pepper. Um, and so when you think of pepper also, it's relaxing. It's a, you know, it suppresses some of that um, anxious feelings. So these are some of the things that you're going to find in natural life. And then people who are experiencing autoimmune conditions, you know, they can be depressed. They can have other mental health issues that are combined with this because they're in chronic pain or, you know, chronic uh, flare ups. And so we look at other strains. So that's the thing. We're not always just looking at what strain is going to treat the pain. We're also looking at what's going to help with the quality of life. So limonene we know is um, found in citrus fruits, lemons, um, orange peels. Um, and we know that those fruit rinds, rosemary is another one, are very important in helping us kind of boost our mood. Um, and so these are things, if we're in a better mood, if we're more relaxed, like all of these things add to our quality of life, reduce Absolutely. our pain um, and help us, um, you know, be more active. Sometimes people can't move because they're in pain and sometimes they need motivation to move. So having a little limonene um, that can give them that boost of like, okay, I feel alive and I can get moving.
in addition, having that pain relief, it's like the perfect combination. I tell people all the time when I'm in pain, which is often um, just having a little something, I go hiking and I have a little bit of, um, it just depends on what strains I have, because of course it's like, once you find a strain that really works, then it just disappears. Um, right. And you can't find it again. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> but I try to have like a variety of strains on hand that I know this strain is going to help me by one, boosting my mood and two, giving me the motivation I need to get up to the top of this mountain, as well as <laughs> numbing my pain, you know, so that I can make it to the top. And that combination is enough for me to get hiking and go up to the top of a mountain. And some people right. never think they can make it to the top of a mountain, but with right. the right medicine, that might be an option for you. That might be right. a potential for you. Absolutely. Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, you know, as an HIV patient, taking that medication every single day, your diet, it, it's prescribed to take every 24 hours. And every time I take that pill, it's just a reminder of this disease and it can mm. be debilitating. And so mm. recently I was told that joy is my superpower. Mm. Um, it comes naturally to me, but I know that not everyone has the same superpower. Um, and sometimes we need some, some other things that are going to help us with that because joy has been tremendous in helping me heal along yes. with my food, along with moving. I love hiking. It's one of my favorite things to do here in Las Vegas. Um, but it's a combination of things that kind of help me towards healing. And, yes. and, uh, and so I, when people come to me and they're asking me, you know, what, what kind of weed can I use to, to, um, cure diabetes? And I'm like, well, wait, let's, let's first talk about what are you eating? Yes. Um, are you moving enough? You know, what are you putting in your body that is causing the diabetes? Then we can talk about maybe how we can use cannabis, incorporate cannabis and other plant medicines and to help with that disease. Yes. Um, so I'm always, food is always my first line of defense mm. uh, because Love I know it. how important it is. I know how I feel when I consume a bunch of junk versus when I'm eating clean, wholesome foods um, and just the energy that I feel. And, you know, a live electric foods make a huge difference in, in what you, in how it makes you feel. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can have that. cannabis, you can have cannabis and feel good, but you can also have cannabis and, you know, make changes in your lifestyle and feel great, you know, and feel like great. So exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Agreed. Okay. So, um, we've, we've got a few more minutes here. Yeah. I want to run through, um, a couple more, yeah. uh, fibromyalgia is Ooh, our next fibromyalgia. you know, fibromyalgia was a quite an interesting one. Um, it did have studies, which was great. And I want to, I'm saying they do have actually clinical studies because they have a pharmaceutical version of THC that's been used, which is Nabilone. And that is, um, oh, that's a new one. Trials. I haven't heard that one yet. Yeah. And that one's been used in trials and it does have positive um, effects in the clinical trials, um, they had an 81% positivity rate when using this particular pharmaceutical medicine with uh, fibromyalgia patients. The most important thing to know here is that there were all these studies were done and they did studies on different ways of administering. So some of them had CBD and THC, some of them had high THC, some of them had low CBD, high CBD, some of them had a combination of THC, CBD, and opioids. Um, but in all of the cases, they all saw positive results. And so I thought that was um, very reassuring because it shows us that you know, people are seeing benefits from this. And even though we're still, again, surface, we're going to, you know, all of the conditions we talked about today, I want to say, let's come back next year. Let's come back the year later. Let's see what the new data shows, because we're getting, we're opening up more. Um, you know, they're opening us up more to clinical research now. Um, I feel like, you know, COVID has kind of like put a standstill on some of the work that's out there. Um, but I feel like in a year, we're going to just see so much more happening, especially because during pandemic, remember, cannabis was considered um, an essential medicine, essential drug. It was it was essential. And right, so because right. of it being essential, I feel like we are going to be seeing so much more um, research out there. But this research actually excited me because I know individuals that suffer with fibromyalgia. And I know how hard it is. And so some people don't know with fibromyalgia, again, it's an autoimmune condition. There's a lot of inflammation, but the big thing is pain, generalized pain, um, joint pain, um, you know, 
and and depression. Depression was like a big thing that affected people with fibromyalgia. And with this these studies, it showed that participants scored significantly higher in their mental health um, status being positive because of using cannabis when those when compared to those who were using just traditional pharmaceutical medicine. So I think that's awesome. Now you know the challenge here is they use a pharmace pharmaceutical version of THC. Um, you know, when we're using the naturally occurring plant, I would assume that we're going to see even more benefits, honestly, because I feel like sometimes the pharmaceuticals, they don't combine the whole plant. They just, again, we're isolating THC and these different components. So I would love to see this done with using the whole plant. They did use CBD and THC for some trials. Um, and again, all of them were positive. Um, I feel like an 80% positivity result is really good. There were 17 primary studies um, and then eight related studies. So, you know, we have a good, what, 25-ish studies that have solid information about how we can help with minimizing pain, reducing inflammation, um, helping patients have a better quality of life. Um, so, wow, there's a lot of information <laughs> that we covered today. Um, we only had an hour to discuss a lot. We didn't get to type 1 diabetes or IBS, but I really wanted to let people know that we are going to have a full week discussing autoimmune disorders. Um, we'll be touching on sickle cell as well during that week, uh, but just talking about how, what these symptoms are, how to treat them, what the, what the options are for people out there, talking more in depth about these different researches that have happened, maybe um, letting people know what options they have in their state. There might be a medical research in there close to them. Um, so we'll be talking about all of those things coming up in September. You all stay tuned. We'll have a whole week to discuss everything, every one of these diseases and really yes. dive in deep about you know, what your treatment options are and also maybe finding a can of nurse of color near you that can kind of help guide you um, with your treatment options. Um, and before we go, please tell us how do we get in touch with you, um, the Kush nurse <laughs> um, and the cannabis nurses of color? How do we do that? Sure. You can find me at The Kush Nurse pretty much on all social media. And my website is thekushnurse.com. Um, for Cannabis Nurses of Color, we are at Canna Nurses, C-N-O-C. C-N-O-C is Canna Nurses of Color. So at Canna Nurses, C-N-O-C. Um, our website should be out here very shortly. We're so excited to release that to you guys. We're going to have a lot of um, training, education, and resources for nurses and individuals. Um, so stay looking for that. Hopefully we'll have that out here next month. <laughs> We've been doing all the final behind the scenes tweaks. Um, and again, just connect with us. We're always available if you want to DM us and just ask any questions. Um, and again, if you're a nurse who's interested in the cannabis industry as a profession, you know, there are a lot of barriers and there are a lot of challenges in this industry, but we're here to, you know, move through these challenges together, break down these walls and barriers because the conversations need to happen. Our people need us. Um, you know, when I go home and I'm talking to people, whether it's in Mississippi where my husband's from or New York City or Charlotte or any of my, my homes, I always tell people it's important for us to have these conversations because the truth is that people are scared. We're still scared to use cannabis as medicine because of all the, you know, ramifications that come with Propaganda. it, whether it's employment, mm -hmm. whether it's, you legal. know, whatever, right. legal, family, right. et cetera. Right. Um, but there are options out there, um, you know, definitely get some resources and connect with people who can guide you because that's the, that's what's going to give you the confidence. And I know for me, a lot of times when I'm working with people, they initially are like, I don't want to get high. I don't want this. I don't want that. And then we evolve <laughs> past that. Okay. We evolve. Right. Right. <laughs> and, right. Um, right. and the evolution is a journey, you know, and you don't want to go through that alone. So that's one of the goals of cannabis nursing is that we can guide you so that you're not going through this alone, um, even though it is a personal journey. 
Absolutely. Um, and and one of the questions I want to answer that was brought up, did we already discuss rheumatoid arthritis? Yes, that was the first one that we discussed. So if you missed this episode, please go to our Facebook page. You can um, see it on our YouTube channel um, and the replay and, and see some of the things we talked about. If you have any further questions, please reach out to the Kush nurse um, and to Cannabis Nurses of Color. Uh, you all stay tuned. Um, next month, I'll be announcing coming up here soon our dates for our health is wellness week uh, where we'll be diving in deeper we'll have the cannabis nurses of color back on to help us um, uh, dive into all of those things all of those diseases but everyone who joined us today thank you so very much we really appreciate you joining us and um, thank you again nurse Sandra I really appreciate yes. all of your knowledge and all of your wisdom you. and I look forward to discussing with you again um, talking more about how we can help people in our community um, really face and fight um, their, their diagnosis and and really be on a path to wellness so thank you yes. again thank you thank you guys for having us and thank you for everyone that joined have a good one all right, you too. Thanks. Bye, everybody.